me introduce and thanks uh, the organizing committee. Uh, Roberto Contino, I hope he's here. He finished his lecture. Roberto, are you here? Not yet. So I will thank him after. Guido, Guido D'Amico. Hi, I'm here. Okay. Francesco Deramo. Hello. Davide Marzocca. Hi. Domenico Orlando. Hello, everyone. Alessandro Spondrini. Hi, everyone. Andrea Tesi. Hello. And Riccardo Torre. To Roberto is here. Stefani. Roberto. Yeah, sorry, I just joined. <laughs> Hi. Oh, okay. Roberto, welcome. <laughs> welcome, and, and Riccardo. Not, not here yet. Okay. Uh, I want to really to thank them, uh, all of them, for their help and perfect organization. And uh, thank you all for being participating. And uh, now I ask Guido to be the chair of the first session. And thanks again and enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Stefania. Uh, it is a pleasure to start uh, uh, this new series of uh, uh, seminars and uh, the colloquia. Um, and uh, uh, we start the series with uh, Mark Kamionkowski, uh, who works at John Topic in this university. Uh, Mark is uh, one of the leading cosmologists uh, uh, in the world. Uh, it's, uh, he worked uh, in uh, particle physics, cosmology, astrophysics. Uh, he helped define what is now known as the field of astroparticle physics. Uh, it's uh, hard to pick a topic on which uh, he hasn't worked on. Um, but uh, um, his main uh, um, works uh, uh, could be um, taken as uh, uh, the study of the polarization of the cosmic microwave background and uh, in general uh, uh, starting the precision uh, cosmology, the, the study of precision cosmology uh, that uh, uh, keeps uh, us all busy today. Uh, and uh, uh, study of dark matter, um, study of uh, uh, gravitational waves, uh, phase transition in the early universe, neutrino physics, uh, modified gravity theories, uh, and in general, uh, uh, Mark today uh, works uh, uh, on uh, uh, development of new methods uh, to test uh, fundamental physics uh, through astrophysical interactions through astrophysical observations, actually. Um, so today he will uh, uh, discuss uh, whether uh, uh, our current uh, best model of cosmology, the so-called Lambda CDM concordance model, uh, is showing uh, uh, some cracks, uh, whether we should uh, be worried uh, and what the future uh, awaits for us. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see, can you all see the, let's see, can you see the screen now? Yes. So in the meantime, uh, um, let me uh, stress that uh, uh, we, uh, you, you can ask questions, but uh, uh, during the talk, only like very urgent or important questions uh, and uh, um, all, smaller doubts uh, and uh, uh, points for discussion, uh, please write in the chat uh, and we'll have time to discuss them later on. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Okay, so I will tell you today about some recent work on the Hubble tension in early dark energy. Um, I thought I would start with oops, telling you about my collaborators. Um, I contributed a bit to this work, but most of it is done by my collaborators, who include Tom V. Carwell, who was a graduate student, now a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, Vivian Poulin, who was a graduate student, sorry, a postdoc at Johns Hopkins University when this work began, but is now a CNRS Montpellier. Tristan Smith at Swarthmore College, Kimberly Body, who was a postdoc at the time, now an assistant professor at UT Austin. Uh, some of it is done with Jose Luis Bernal, who is a current postdoc. And some of it 
also is done with um, Simeon Berg, who was a postdoc uh, a while ago at Johns Hopkins, but now is faculty member at UC Riverside. Um, so this is going to be a talk about cosmology. And the point of cosmology is to um, describe and understand the history and evolution and origin of the universe. Um, so when we look back in time, <clears throat> when we look out into the sky with telescopes, we see galaxies, which are agglomerations of several billion stars gravitationally held together. Um, when we look um, at larger distances, though, we see things that they, as they were at earlier times, because it takes some amount of time for the light from these objects at earlier, these uh, more distant objects to reach us. So when we look at more distant objects, we see galaxies that are younger than the galaxies that we see closer by. And when we look even further, in principle, we should be able to see when the first stars form. Um, and when we look with, uh, if we look at the sky, not with optical or ultraviolet or infrared telescopes, the ones that we use to see these galaxies, if we look at the sky in radio frequencies, we see that there's a cosmic microwave background which, as I will tell you, um, we believe provides a snapshot of the universe as it was approximately 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And all these measurements suggest that inflation or something that looks quite a bit like it took place in the very early universe um, very shortly after the Big Bang. <clears throat> the universe is about 14 billion years old. Um, the first stars and galaxies formed, we believe about 400 million years after the Big Bang. And um, this is how the universe looks to us. Now, one of the most salient features of the universe is its expansion discovered by Edwin Hubble um, close to 100 years ago, about 90, a little bit more, a little less, a little more than 90 years ago. So what Hubble saw and what has been confirmed by many measurements since is that when we look at a given galaxy, any given galaxy appears or is moving away from us. We can tell from the redshift, um, the Doppler shift of atomic and molecular absorption and emission features in the spectrum of the galaxy. And by comparing those observed frequencies with the rest frame frequency, so we see that these galaxies are moving away from us because the light from them is Doppler shifted. And what Hubble discovered is that if we plot the velocity versus the distance to the galaxy, um, that relation is roughly linear. And the constant of proportionality, H, we call Hubble's constant, sometimes written as H sub zero to denote the value of the Hubble today, <clears throat> And it has units of velocity divided by distance. And the point of this talk, um, the motivation for this talk is that measurements we have of the Hubble constant now have become very precise, but they don't all agree. So I will say more about this plot later on, but this is basically the motivation. So we now have measurements of the Hubble constant from local measurements and from, um, the cosmic microwave background. Um, and as you can see, they disagree. They disagree now at more than, more than five sigma level. The units are kilometers per second per megaparsec, velocity divided by distance. Um, here, a megaparsec is three times 10 to the 24th centimeters or 3 million light years. Um, but it is a unit of distance that we use in cosmology. And roughly speaking, it is the typical distance between galaxies. So the nearest galaxy to our own is the Andromeda galaxy, which is about 0 0.7 megaparsecs away. So something that is, you know, 10 galaxies away is about 10 megaparsecs away. So local measurements, which I will discuss, um, give you values around 74. And the cosmic microwave background in, gives us values around 67. Now, I'll just, I won't say a whole lot about the local measurements, but I will say quite a bit about the cosmic microwave background measurements because those are a little more complicated. The local measurements are done in the same way that Hubble did. You measure the velocity, which you obtain from the, um, the observed frequencies of these atomic molecular um, um, emission lines. 
And those velocities can be measured very precisely. The distances are inferred or obtained um, assuming that you have an object that has um, a given brightness. So in particular, there is something called the type 1a supernova, which is an explosion that occurs when a white dwarf has exceeded the Chandrasekhar mass. And that mass is something that's determined by fundamental physical parameters. It's about 1.4 solar masses. And so it's believed that every time one of these white dwarfs exceeds the its Chandrasekhar mass, it undergoes collapse and blows up and should have an explosion that has the same luminosity. And so the distances are obtained by looking at the brightness of supernova that we see and comparing it with the um, luminosity of an individual supernova. So that is in principle a straightforward analysis, straightforward way to infer the distances. And it is these supernovae, these type 1a supernovae, these exploding white dwarfs um, that give us the local measurements. Now, I am a theorist and this will be a primarily theory talk. So I won't talk too much about the measurements, but there are three or four possible ways to account for this discrepancy. So one of them is that there's a problem with the local measurements. Another is that there's a problem with the cosmic microwave background measurements. There's also some possibility that both of those measurements are problematic. Um, but the fourth, measure, the fourth explanation, which is what I will focus on, given that I'm a theorist, is that perhaps this discrepancy indicates that there's something missing from our standard cosmological model. Maybe there's some new physics that's required in order to explain it. So that is why I will focus on in this talk. So to begin, I will review how the cosmic microwave background measurements are made because it's important to understand how they're made if we are going to try to alter the standard cosmological model in such um, so as to explain this Hubble tension. So we live in a universe that's about 14 billion years old. And when we look at the cosmic microwave background, we are looking at a spherical surface in the early universe. And we are seeing light emitted from that spherical surface um, when the universe was about 400,000 years old. So we're seeing a spherical surface that has a radius of about 14 billion light years. And we're seeing that spherical surface in the early universe as it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. When we look at this cosmic microwave background, which is um, uh, the afterglow from creation, it is a gas of black body radiation with a temperature of 2.7 K, um, radio frequency measurements. Um, it looks like this. So when you look out at the sky with um, ordinary telescopes or you know, with your eyes, you see a lot of different galaxies but most of the sky is dark. If you could look at the sky, if your eyes operated at radio frequencies and they were very sensitive, you would see that the entire sky glows. But if your eyes were also sensitive enough to measure intensity fluctuations of one part in 10 to the fifth, then this is what you would see. So to a first approximation, the entire sky glows with a temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin. But if you have a very precise measurement of the temperature, and very fine angular resolution, you will see that there are hot spots represented by the red and cold spots represented by the blue. Now to a first approximation, there is no structure in this map. It looks like a random noise map. Um, it does appear though that there are some structures. There are hot and cold spots that seem to be approximately tens of degrees across in the sky, like this blue spot over here, this red spot over here. But there's also granularity on finer angular scales. And the angular resolution that we have now is approximately five arc minutes, something on order of a tenth of a degree. And we see granularity on all the angular scales that we have resolved so far. But as we will see in a, next, in a forthcoming slide, um, the characteristic angular size is roughly one degree. So the average size is in some sense of the hot and cold spots is roughly one degree across. Now, the way we make that statement more precise is through um, a Fourier analysis, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But what I'm going to do or attempt to do now is explain to you how it is we go from this map 
to a measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. So the way it works is that when we look at this map, there are three angular scales that we can infer. One is called theta sub s, the sound horizon, theta sub d, the damping scale, and theta equality, the angular scale subtended by matter radiation equality in the early universe. So I'll go through each one of these one at a time. So the way we look at this map <clears throat> is as follows. So in configuration space, which is what this looks like you know, when we just look at it, it looks like a random noise map. But if we take a two-dimensional Fourier transform of this two-dimensional map, this is a map of the two-dimensional surface of the sky. If we take a Fourier transform of this map and then plot the square of the Fourier amplitudes as a function of wave number, we find that there is a power spectrum that has very well-defined and interesting features. So here we go from left to right. This is the wave number. Um, and the wavelength of each Fourier mode is indicated on the top. So these are one degree of um, wavelength. These are 0 0.2 degrees, 0 0.1 degrees, et cetera. And off to the left is 90 degrees, L equals two to the quadrupole. Um, strictly speaking, since this is a spherical two-dimensional surface rather than a flat two-dimensional surface, we are doing a spherical harmonic transform, which is the spherical surface analog of a Fourier transform. And so the wave number um, is a multiple moment L over here. So it goes from two, the quadrupole at the left, all the way out to several thousand on the right. And it, if you look, this power spectrum peaks at L of roughly 200, which corresponds to one degree in the sky which is the justification for my statement that the characteristic angular scale is roughly one degree. And beyond that, we see other bumps and wiggles in the power spectrum. And the bumps and wiggles are roughly sinusoidal. And there are also troughs that are not filled in. So um, there's several things that we can say about this power spectrum. First of all, it is measured very, very precisely now. The error bars are smaller than the sizes of the data points over here. Um, we have a very, we have a, a roughly scale invariant power spectrum. So it's so some approximation um, over three decades in wave number. Um, this quantity, the Fourier amplitudes are roughly constant, but there are these little wiggles over here. And the fact that we have these wiggles over here allows us to infer a number of parameters or you know, quantities from the data. This is not just a straight line, which is described by two numbers. It's not a um, parabola, which is described by three numbers. Um, there are a variety of bumps and wiggles. Each one has a different amplitude and a different trough height. And so there's a lot of information that we can infer from this power spectrum. And the first piece of information that we infer is something that we call theta sub s, which is the sound horizon. And I am going to play a movie that shows you um, what the sound horizon is. But before I do so, I'm going to tell you what you're looking at. So we have a universe that is very smooth. And if we think about the early universe, we had um, a system that had a very nearly homogeneous density. Um, and it consisted of dark matter of Actually, I can't see this right now. The dark matter, it consisted of neutrinos and it also consisted of um, photons and baryons. Now suppose that if on top of this smooth distribution of dark of, of stuff, dark matter, neutrinos, photons, and baryons, we introduced a delta function or you know, narrow peak, density peak of dark matter baryons, photons, and neutrinos. So suppose that in the early universe, instead of having a perfectly smooth homogeneous early universe, we had one point in the universe where the density of all the components of matter, dark matter, neutrinos, photons, and baryons was higher. Well, you can imagine that what happens is that the baryons and photons, which form a tightly coupled plasma because the early universe consists of ionized electrons and pro uh, ionized hydrogen atoms, and the photons scatter from the electrons, 
they form a plasma. And if we have a high density region, that high density region is also gonna be at high pressure. And that high pressure region will then expand as a blast wave out in the, into the surrounding medium. So this movie is going to show you the expansion of that blast wave as it goes out into the expanding medium in the photons and in the dark matter. Sorry, in the photons and the baryons. The dark matter interacts with everything else only gravitationally. And so it's going to be spread out slowly given that the gravitational field of the photons and baryons is expanding outward. So it's gonna be attracted more slowly to this expanding um, shock wave of baryons and photons. And the neutrinos though are collisionless and move at the speed of light. So they simply diffuse out with time. So here is the movie. So here is the dark matter. It is spreading out slowly. Here is the shock wave in the photons and in the baryons. And I'm going to stop the movie 380,000 years after the big bang. So what we've seen is that from the Big Bang, time equals zero, until 380,000 years after the Big Bang, what's happened is that this shock wave in the baryons and photons has expanded out to the sound horizon. So 380,000 years times the speed of sound. And in this early universe, the energy density is dominated by the photons. So the speed of sound is roughly one divided by the square root of three times the speed of light. So it's one over the square root of three of the light horizon. So that is this spherical over density over here. The dark matter has expanded out a little bit, but more smoothly because it's, been, uh, it's not coupled to the, everything else except through gravity. And the neutrinos have diffused out. So this is how this overdensity would appear at the surface of last scatter. Now what happens afterwards is that the photons then free stream. So suppose we looked out into the sky and somewhere in the early universe there was this overdensity and then had expanded by this sound horizon. We would then see this spherical overdensity. But when you then take, um, the Fourier transform, it winds up looking like this. So if I take a Fourier transform of this spherical shell, the spherical blast wave, the spherical blast wave is fairly, fairly sharp in configuration space, but in Fourier space, it has ringing. And the spacing in Fourier space of these um, spherical shells, the Fourier transform of these spherical shells, um, the peaks that show up in the ringing have wave numbers that are inversely proportional to the sound horizon. So this is the Fourier transform of that blast wave. This is the, in some sense, the Green's function for that um, blast wave that has a size of the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter. Now, strictly speaking, the early universe does not have just one um, overdense region. Strictly speaking, the universe has some spectrum of fluctuations, but each, but the Green's function for that spectrum of fluctuation still looks like this. So when we look at the cosmic microwave background power spectrum, the peaks, the location of these peaks are ringing in Green's in the configuration space of the Green's function of that blast wave and the wave numbers that they subtend indicate the angular size of the surface of the, of the, the angular scale subtended by the sound horizon at the surface of last scatter. So that is one parameter that we can infer from the cosmic microwave background and it is 1.0404 and it is actually measured to approximately one part in 10 to the four, the four significant figures. The next parameter that we can infer from the cosmic microwave background is something called the damping scale, theta sub d or photon diffusion length. Now, earlier I showed you a picture of our universe and I showed you a cosmic microwave background surface of last scatter that I represented as a sharp feature. In practice though, what happens is, is in the early universe at very large distances, we have free electrons and protons 
Um, but as the universe cools with time, those electrons and protons combine to form hydrogen atoms. So that recombination, that formation of hydrogen atoms occurs uh, approximately 380,000 years after the Big Bang, but it's not a sudden recombination. It actually takes some amount of time for the electrons and protons to combine to form hydrogen atoms. And therefore, when we look at the cosmic microwave background, not all the photons come from the same distance. Some of them come from later times, but some of them might also come from earlier times. So that surface of last scatter is blurred. It's not a sharp feature, it's blurred. So this plot shows you what the cosmic microwave background power spectrum would look like if that surface of last scatter was perfectly sharp. But if, since it's not exactly perfectly sharp, that um, image of the surface of last scatter is blurred. And so the features on smaller scales are um, suppressed in Fourier space. So this indicates the blurring due to the finite thickness of the surface of last scatter. So by measuring the heights, the observed heights of the peaks relative to those predicted, we had a perfectly sharp feature, we can measure this thickness of the surface of last scatter. And that is the second parameter that we can infer. And it is also measured very precisely to be about 0 0.1609. Now, the third parameter is a little more difficult to describe or explain, but it indicates or is due to the total dark matter density. Now, what happens is that um, if I have an initially overdense region, gravitational infall will cause that overdense region to become increasingly overdense. And initially, the baryons and photons fall with the dark matter. But at some point, um, the pressure over density, the, the, uh, the pressure associated with overdensity causes them to rebound and produce that blast wave that we saw. So what happens is that um, when we look at the power spectrum, here we are seeing Fourier modes that have bounced in and then out say for the second one over here, whereas here we've seen just one that's fallen in. So when we look at the relative heights of the odd number peaks and the even number peaks, they tell us something about the total dark matter density. And if we compare that dark matter density with the radiation density that we see in the cosmic microwave background today, that tells us the time um, at which the matter and radiation had equal matter densities in the early universe. And then theta eek, we infer from the relative heights of the even and odd peaks, and that is the angular scale subtended by the, um, the epoch of matter and radiation quality. And that's a third parameter that we can infer phenomenologically from the data to be approximately 0 0.81. Now, these three angles, the sound horizon, the damping scale, and the matter radiation equality, that we can infer from the cosmic microwave background are three phenomenological parameters. And we can calculate those parameters for a given cosmological model. But it turns out that these three phenomenological parameters depend on the dark matter density, the baryon density, and the Hubble constant. These three quantities over here are three functions of these three cosmological parameters, which we can also, a function that we can also invert. So if we measure the sound horizon damping scale and matter radiation equality, uh, matter radiation equality, then we can infer from them some combination of the dark matter density, the baryon density, and the Hubble constant. So we don't actually measure the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. We infer it from the measurements in combination with the dark matter density and the baryon density. Now, it turns out that of these three phenomenological parameters, the sound horizon is the best determined quantity. And it is determined to roughly one part in 10 to the fourth. And the reason that's important is that if we are going to try to alter our cosmological model to infer a larger value of the Hubble parameter, we have to do so in such a way that the angular scale subtended by the sound horizon is fixed. Now, um, when we look at the sky, the cosmic microwave background, we see, we measure things, um, the angular scale. 
Now we see the sound horizon, the angular scale subtended by the sound horizon. And that angular scale is the ratio of the sound horizon of 380,000 years times the speed of sound. That's this distance over here, divided by d sub a, the angular diameter distance to the surface of last scatter. So this is the distance, roughly 14 billion light years between the surface of last scatter and us. So this parameter of theta sub s is fixed. Now, this is the formula for the angular diameter distance. And this is the formula for, or the equation for the sound horizon. So the angular diameter distance turns out according to the standard cosmological model to be an integral over time. So T naught is the age of the universe today. So it's an integral over the time normalized to the age of the universe today of the total energy density of the universe at time T divided by the energy density of the universe today to the one half power and C is the speed of light and H naught is the Hubble parameter. The radius, sorry, the um, sound horizon. Also, this is an integral from um, recombination, the time that the CMB photons were emitted until today. The sound horizon, sorry, oops. The sound horizon um, has a similar expression, but it is one divided by the expansion rate at recombination. And it's an integral from the big bang, t equals zero until the time of recombination and here the numerator is not the speed of light, it is the speed of sound at time t, but the denominator is, the, is similar. It's the energy density of the universe at time t divided by the energy density of the universe at recombination to the one half power. Now I can algebraically rearrange these two equations to write an equation for the Hubble parameter. So this is how we infer the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. Um, it is the Hubble parameter recombination, which we know from the energy density at recombination, times um, the ratio of this early time integral divided by this late time integral. Now, if we want to increase the value of the Hubble parameter inferred from the cosmic microwave background, we can either decrease the matter density at late times, so if we decrease the matter density at late times, we decrease this row in the denominator of this numerator. And if so, we get a larger Hubble parameter. But remember, we have to do so, we have to decrease the matter density at late times, keeping the matter density today the same. Because it's row of t divided row by row of naught um, that appears in the denominator, row naught, the, the energy density of the universe today. So we can decrease the matter density at late times, but still keeping the matter density today the same. The second possibility is to decrease the sound speed in the early universe. So if we decrease the sound speed in the early universe, we decrease this numerator of this denominator. And that would also lead to a larger value of the Hubble parameter. And the third possibility is to increase the matter density at early times. So if we increase the matter density at early times, we increase this denominator uh, in this denominator, which gives us a larger Hubble parameter. So the first set of solutions are called late time solutions because we're, in, we're changing the cosmic history or cosmic physics at late times. Um, these last solutions are called early um, solutions because they change the physics of early times. There's also the possibility to decrease the sound speed in the early universe. My collaborators and I thought about that a bit, but we were not able to come up with a model that works. Um, in the past few months, there have been several papers that appeared on archive um, that describe models where the sound speed is changed to solve the Hubble tension, but I will not talk about those. I'll talk about the early time solutions very quickly and then focus on the late time solutions. So, um, <clears throat> the late time solutions. So those operate or function by changing the angular diameter distance by increasing, sorry, by decreasing the energy density at late times in such a way that we keep the energy density fixed today. 
So that is very difficult to pull off theoretically. And the reason that it's difficult to pull off theoretically is that it requires that the energy density be smaller than it would be in the standard cosmological model, keeping the energy density of the universe in the energy density um, fixed today. Now we know that in the universe today, there's dark matter and baryons and photons. And we know that earlier times when the universe was smaller, the densities of those components would increase. And we know exactly how they would increase. And so there's a fixed amount of matter and energy density in the universe in the standard cosmological model of early, early times. So if we want to modify the late expansion history to solve the Hubble tension, we have to surmise that the energy density was smaller than the standard cosmological model. Or in other words, it, it implies that we have to surmise that there's some new component of matter in the universe that has a negative energy density. Now, you know from whatever understanding of gravity that you have, either sophisticated or naive, that there is no such thing as ne negative energy density matter in gravity. Um, if you are a general relativist, you would say that's a violation of the null energy condition. And the meaning of violation of null energy condition is that there's nothing that has a negative energy density. So that's just the same way of saying what you sort of already know intuitively. So it doesn't work. We can't make anything work unless we um, surmise some negative energy density matter. Um, and if you do that, you can sort of make it work. So here is a plot from a paper by some collaborators and I from a few years ago. Um, I'm not gonna go through in detail. What we did is we said, let's just let the expansion history be whatever it is, whatever's required to solve the Hubble tension. And what we find is that um, whatever dark energy, exotic matter component we surmise to um, enable this modified expansion history to solve the Hubble tension does at some point be driven, does get driven to negative energy densities. So you can make this solution work if you're willing to accept this very strange physics. But even if you're willing to uh, accept this very strange physics, um, it turns out that there's an observational constraint that rules out any of these late time solutions. So that sound horizon that we saw in that movie is imprinted in the galaxy distribution that over density in the baryons um, that arises um, from that over density in the early universe uh, in the baryons that arises from this uh, acoustic um, this acoustic wave uh, is imprinted on the galaxy distribution because those baryons then produce galaxies. So if we measure the two point correlation function or in some sense, the greens function for the galaxy distribution, it has a peak at roughly 100 and something megaparsecs. Sorry, yeah, something uh, some, a few hundred megaparsecs. So we actually see that baryon overdensity in the greens that that over the, the peak in the greens function for the for the baryons that we see in the late universe, and that provides a standard ruler that allows us to measure the Hubble constant at late times without resorting to supernovae. And this also, this measurement also provides a standard ruler that provides a lower value of the Hubble constant. So <clears throat> these late time solutions, even if you're willing to accept the very strange physics that would require, that, that they require um, is ruled out by empirical constraints. Um, so I said there's, you can postulate a sound speed, um, modified sound speed, um, which we have not been able to make work yet, but although other people have studied. Um, so I'm going to talk about now this early, um, this idea to change the physics at early times to modify the early expansion history. And this is an idea that we call early dark energy. And the first discussion was in a paper with Tan V. Carwal from four years ago. And it was a very, very simple paper, a very simple idea. And the basic idea is that if we postulate some new contribution to the matter density at early times, then that can increase the expansion rate at early times. And if the expansion rate is increased at early times, then as those equations show, the sound horizon becomes smaller and we infer a larger Hubble parameter from the cosmic microwave background. So we made a plot that looks something like this. 
This is a plot of the energy density of the different components of matter in the universe as a function of redshift. So early times is off to the right and the universe today is off to the left. Um, there are, is dark matter and baryons in the universe today, the orange line over here. There is radiation, the red line over here. Uh, sorry, the blue line over here. Um, the, co the combination of the matter and radiation gives us the red line over here. And then, sorry, and then there's also the cosmological constants that we infer from um, a variety of measurements. And so those three components of matter gives a standard model prediction, which is this red line over here. And what we postulated is that there's something that looks like a cosmological constant or has a constant energy density at early times, but then decays more faster, um, faster than radiation at late times. And if you do this, then the fraction of the total energy density provided by this early dark energy um, is very is negligible in the early universe, becomes roughly 10% of the total energy density um, sometime before recombination, which takes place at redshift of, of 1100, which is this vertical line over here. But then by the time those CMB photons last scatter and at late times, the universe looks exactly like it does in the standard cosmological model. So that was what we postulated. And in principle, this should change the sound horizon in such a way to solve the Hubble tension. Um, but the devil is in the details because those measurements of the power spectrum we have are very precise. Um, I should also say that there are two physical models, toy models that we proposed or um, in this paper to um, account for this early dark energy. If we have some new scalar field that has a confining potential that looks like this, and the scalar field is initially displaced from the minimum of its potential, then you can show that at early times it is stuck and behaves like a cosmological constant, and at late times it oscillates, and the energy density then decays a scale factor to 2n minus 2 divided by 2n plus 2, where n is this parameter over here. So if n is big enough, 2 or larger, then um, the energy density um, will decay faster than radiation um, as indicated in this plot over here. The other possibility is that we simply have a scalar field phi that has a relatively smooth potential that looks just like this um, hill, hill over here. And so if the scalar field is initially displaced from the minimum of its potential, again, it remains frozen there at early times and behaves like a cosmological constant. But at some time, appropriate time, it begins to roll. And once it gets to the minimum of this potential and rolls, again, its energy density decays um, precisely as required by the early dark energy model. Now, it took, though, two years for us to acquire all the calculational and analytical tools, as well as the collaborators to help us with those calculational and analytic tools, to actually figure out whether we could get a model to actually not only move the sound horizon where we want, but to do so in such a way that the measurement that um, in such a way that the uh, that is consistent with the detailed measurements of the cosmic microwave background power spectrum. So this took a few years of hard work. It's straightforward, but um, it's not easy. So what happens is we need to calculate the power spectrum predicted by any given early dark energy model. So what that means is that for each combination of cosmological parameters, like the dark matter density, the baryon density, and the Hubble constant, and early dark energy parameters, um, like the um, initial displacement of the scalar field and the scalar field potential parameters, you have to evolve in time from the Big Bang to the present a series of couple differential equations for the dark matter density and velocity, the baryon density and velocity, um, the evolution of the scalar field, the evolution of the gravitational fields, um, as well as the evolution of the neutrino distribution function and the photon distribution function, which we describe in terms of its moments, the monopole, dipole, quadrupole, and then the higher moments, octopole, L, um, and we need to follow the thousands of moments of these photon distribution function because we actually measure the photon distribution function up to Ls of several thousand. That's what the cosmic microwave background power spectrum is. 
And we have to do this for each spatial Fourier mode of the um, density distribution in the early universe. Um, fortunately, um, there is a publicly available code called class that was designed to do all of this. And fortunately, in an earlier paper from 2018, um, my collaborators and I, and primarily my collaborators, I is a <coughs> one letter word, which is uh, an appropriate description of my contributions. Um, developed um, a modified version of this publicly available class to um, take into account the oscillating scalar field and the slowly rolling scalar field. And so we had the calculations available thanks to earlier work by others and by this group. And then for each oscillating field model or slow roll, slow roll model, um, actually I'm not gonna mention this, um, for each model, we had to calculate the CMB temperature and polarization power spectrum and the galaxy power spectrum. And then we had to do some data analysis. And what data analysis involves is for each model, which is some combination um, parameterized by some combination of cosmological and early dark energy parameters, um, we have to determine a likelihood or chi-squared um, for the, um, that, um, that describes the agreement of that model with the cosmic microwave background and galaxy power spectrum. And what we're trying to do is see whether we can find some combination of cosmological and early dark energy model um, parameters that allow a high Hubble parameter that still provide a good fit to the data. And I should say that when we began this work, I did not think that we would be able to do so. I thought that we would just place constraints to the model, but it turned out, well, let me show you. So what we're trying to do is um, you know, the, the calculation spit out a power spectrum that looked like this, and we want to fit it to data that looks like this. And it also spits out a galaxy power spectrum. So this is that two-point correlation function in Fourier space. That peak in Fourier space shows up as ringing in the, two, in the power spectrum for the galaxies. Um, and that ringing is these wiggles over here. And so we're trying to find theoretical curves that will have wiggles that agree with the measured wiggles. Um, and we then um, wind up with a nine dimensional parameter space. There are six classical cosmological parameters and three early dark energy models. We wind up with a nine dimensional a volume and then nine dimensional parameter space. And we're looking for the volume in that nine dimensional parameter space that provides a good fit to the data. And we show our results in this field with um, two-dimensional um, arrays of plots that look like this, where we have on one axis um, some subset of the parameters. So this is the Hubble parameter over here. This is the um, total energy density of um, early dark energy. Um, this, and then these are other cosmological parameters. But these are two-dimensional slices through that nine-dimensional cosmological parameter space. And what we're trying to see is whether there's any regions where we can have a good um, a high Hubble parameter. And then at the top of each one of these um, horiz uh, vertical um, array, vertical columns, we have a likelihood, which is an integral over the other eight-dimensional um, eight volume other eight, eight, eight parameters. So this is a likelihood of any given parameter marginalized over the other cosmological parameters. So this sh shows you the standard um, um, result the, of the standard cosmological result for cosmic microwave background data, which indicate a um, Hubble constant around 0 0.68 times 100 kilometers per mega per second per megaparsec. So, <laughs> This is the money plot from our paper. So this is a four by four subset of that nine dimensional cosmological early dark energy parameter space. And as I said, when we began this project, I did not think that we would actually be able to find models that work, but this plot actually shows that we can. So this is the Hubble constant, this column over here. This is the energy density in cold dark matter, um, this is the Hubble constant. Um, but what I want you to focus on is this plot over here and this plot over here for the Hubble constant. 
So this very small orange ellipse, this is the very tight result for the Hubble parameter that we get um, in the standard cosmological model. Um, and that is around 0 0.68. And then if we open up the parameter space to allow for early dark energy, what we find is that we can get a likelihood that gets shifted to the right and that overlaps with the gray line, which is the likelihood from local measurements. And so we can't shift the Hubble constant to arb arbitrarily high values, but with early dark energy, we can in fact get the Hubble parameter um, to um, acceptably large values. We can get acceptably large values of the Hubble parameter. Um, values of the Hubble parameter that agree within one sigma of the um, local measurements. Now, there's another thing I need to tell you about the analysis and the results that is not indicated by these plots. It's not enough to show that the likelihood, gets, likelihood function gets shifted to the right. We also need to be able to tell you that, in one, for, that for at least one combination of parameters, the chi-squared is good, that the uh, agreement with the data, the reduced chi-squared is acceptable. And that is not shown by this plot, but I am, can tell you that there are regions of the parameter space in the, that fall within this purple region over here, where the chi-squared, the reduced chi-squared is the same, if not slightly better than the best fit reduced chi-squareds from um, the standard cosmological analysis. So it turns out, and it was a surprise to me, we actually can find early dark energy models that um, allow for a higher value of the Hubble parameter and provide a good fit to the cosmic microwave background measurements. Now, if we have a new model that has, uh, we are supposed to um, provide predictions for new measurements that can be done to further test the model. Now, the model that we have does in fact provide um, predictions that can't that are different from those in the standard cosmological model that can be tested, um, hopefully with measurements on the next say five to 10 year time scale. And that is from the very fine angular scale features in the cosmic microwave background polarization. So it turns out that the cosmic microwave background is linearly polarized and this is sort of a picture uh, or a simulation of a cosmic microwave background temperature map in a polarization map. And here the color contrasts are the temperature. But at any given point in the sky, you also have a line which indicates the magnitude and orientation of the polarization. And this polarization is now measured pretty well. And we characterize it also in terms of a power spectrum. And the point of this plot is to show you that if you take the best fit cosmological model which is the orange curve over here, and um, some early dark energy models, they both provide equally good fits to the current polarization power spectra. The current polarization power spectra have fairly large error bars, and so you can't really distinguish between the two. But if you look carefully, there's sort of this narrower band over here this faint narrower band over here. And this is a forecast of what the error bar should look like with measurements by new experiments like CNBS4 or the Simons Observatory, which are projects that are supposed to occur over the next say five to 10 years. And they indicate that you should be able to tell the differences between these different curves. And this plot provided by Vivian Poulin actually shows us that a little more carefully. So these are likelihood contours um, in the two-dimensional parameter space of Hubble parameter versus energy density of early dark energy. And the red contours are the current constraints from Planck. And they indicate what I showed you before, that the standard cosmological model, which is no early dark energy and a low Hubble constant, um, are and an early dark energy model with you know, some fraction of, you know, with some early dark energy and a high Hubble constant are both equally acceptable according to the standard cosmological model. But um, if the early dark energy model is in fact the correct one, we should be able to distinguish it at multiple sigma from the standard cosmological model with these future measurements. 
Now, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to spend the last few minutes speculating about what this early dark energy might be if it is in fact what is going on. So we know that there is a cosmological constant in the early universe today. We have very good reason to believe that something like inflation took place in the early universe and inflation involves a cosmological constant in the very early universe. And if early dark energy is what's going on, if that is, if the Hubble tension persists and this turns out to be the explanation, it suggests that there's something like a cosmological constant um, at times close to redshift of about 10,000. And so this seems to suggest that the recurring periods of cosmological constant-like behavior throughout cosmic history. And if that's what's going on, so people have speculated about things like this in the past. So about 20 years ago, there were several papers um, where people postulated that there was some type of um, tracking um, scalar field that had um, small, small, small oscillations. And they showed that if you have a, um, an early or a dark energy field that has an appropriately um, chosen potential, then the fraction of its energy density in units of the total of the critical density can become fairly large of order unity, can behave like a cosmological constant um, at various times in the history of the universe. So this is a plot of the history of the universe where um, today is at the right and the Big Bang is off to the left. So maybe this is what's going on. Another possibility is a string axiverse. <clears throat> so some string theory models um, imply the, success, um, the existence of several hundred axion-like scalar fields with um, a spectrum of masses that are distributed logarithmically. And in earlier work, my collaborators and I um, showed that if so, there's some possibility, um, some small chance at each logarithm of the Hubble time. So essentially at each tick of this clock over here for that a given scalar field to become dynamically important and at least briefly act like a cosmological constant. So that's another possibility. So that is my talk. Local observations um, of the, or local measurements of the Hubble parameter um, disagree with values of the Hubble parameter that we infer from the cosmic microwave background. This discrepancy now occurs at the greater than five sigma level. Um, lots of people have looked at um, the cosmic microwave background data and the local the data from the local measurements and nobody has found anything obviously incorrect or faulty with either one of those measurements. That's not to say that there isn't a possibility that someone may, but a lot of people have um, scrutinized these measurements and these their interpretation and nobody's yet found anything obviously wrong. Um, my collaborators and I have explored the possibility that something that we call early dark energy, um, which is a modification to early universe dynamics might be explaining this Hubble tension. Um, and we've shown that the model can work. Um, we can modify early the early cosmic history in such a way that um, the observations, the measurements um, agree, the, sorry, the, the, the model still um, is consistent with very precise measurements. Um, still, if you look very carefully, there are um, differences in the detailed predictions of this new model and the standard cosmological model in the fine angular scale cosmic microwave background polarization. And this is something that is to be tested soon um, with new data. And um, if this turns out to be uh, what's going on, um, then perhaps there's something that uh, it might be telling us about string theory or other new cosmological physics. So that is all I have to say, and I'm happy to take questions at this point. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I please uh, um, uh, feel free to ask questions or write uh, things in uh, in the chat. Uh, Shaheen Jabari. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, actually, I have uh, several questions, but let me 
ask him uh, the thing which I'm, I've been working on. As you know very well, there are other low redshift data, uh, cosmological data up to uh, redshift, for example, uh, 2.5 or 3 uh, from cosmic chronometers, supernovae, and uh, other sources. And one can infer the value of uh, H0, the Hubble constant, also from these uh, observations. And uh, how does uh, these observations and the results uh, match with the early dark energy model? Can you comment on this? Um, so all of the local measurements, um, so all the, the, the early dark energy model is designed essentially to, so that all of the local measurements, except for the, no, no, all of the local measurements um, should give you the um, same value of the Hubble parameter. Um, there are measurements of the Hubble parameter now from lensing time delays. I would, and those are fairly new measurements. I would say that, um, that uh, the values are still bouncing around. And I think the measurements and the systematic effects still need to be understood before we have good confidence in them. There are measurements, new measurements from the tip of the red giant branch, which have gotten values of the Hubble parameter. They're sort of in between the CMB and supernova values. Um, but there have been some papers recently arguing that the um, calibration of the distance ladder from those tip of the red giant measurements um, were a little bit off and those new recalibrations give you a higher Hubble parameter. Um, so all those measurements should be agreeing if everything hangs together. And uh, just uh, as you know, you mentioned that the early, uh, the late uh, resolutions to the Hubble tension uh, are not favored. But uh, because they uh, re generically require a violation of the null energy condition or a phantom uh, behavior for dark energy. But uh, one can, for example, uh, consider dark matter, dark energy interacting models, where uh, basically the dark matter can decay into dark energy sector and increase the value of the dark energy, in the amount of the dark energy we have. So these models can also uh, produce some. Uh, higher value for the H0 in the late universe. Uh, yeah, I think that is correct. Um, but I think that those models still um, disagree with the bearing of acoustic oscillation measurements. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just um, the theoretical, it's not my just, it's not this just this taste or theoretical prejudice. It's also, I think, um, the measurements mm -hmm. make it okay. difficult. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mark. Very nice talk. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you're suggesting that there was a phase of a, a scalar field dominated phase or scalar field imported phase around the redshift of 10,000, which is around the time of a equilibrium between a, matter and radiation. Uh, is this uh, a coincidence in your model or, um, or, or this is something that you can explain naturally? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, a very good question. In our model, which is just a toy model, it turns out to just be a coincidence. Um, there have been a number of papers that explore um, the possibility to connect that redshift with um, the onset of matter domination. And it turns out that it's difficult to get that to work in general relativity, but in some modified gravity theories, it may be possible. Um, there was also a few papers, I think there was a nice paper by Saxton and Trotten, um, where they tried to connect it to the um, neutrino mass. So it turns out that uh, if the neutrino has a mass of around 0 0.1 electron volts, then um, it would start becoming non-relativistic at about that redshift. So that's another possibility that people looked into. And a, a second related question, if I may, uh, you also invoked in a different context, the scalar field that produce uh, black holes. 
I understand that these are a very different black hole, the different, very, this happens at a very different regime, but is, is this, uh, can you model this if you have periodic oscillations of the, of the scalar field? Is there any connection between the two scales in which you, you, you introduce this uh, scalar yeah, field? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I have not thought about it, but it might be worth thinking about. I don't have anything obvious to say. Sorry, I don't have anything beyond the obvious to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Svi. Uh, it was uh, Anjan and then Zurab and then uh, Andrea Ferrara in the chat. Uh, hello, Mark. Thank you for the, uh, for the great talk. I have two small questions. One is actually related to how much fine tuning you need for this early dark energy because uh, at some point it is dominating, but at some point it has to decay so that it cannot dominate at the later times. So how much fine tuning you need to make it happen? And another thing is that this scalar field that you have at the early time, it should be fluctuating. And uh, today, if you have a dark energy with a scalar field, its fluctuation scale will be of the horizon scale because it is very, uh, I mean, very small mass. But at that time, at the mass of the scalar field, I believe has to be a little means higher. So the fluctuation scale will be higher. So what kind of effect it can have for the corresponding large scale structures? Um, so the first question about fine tuning, um, it is very fine tuned, it is so fine tuned that anybody who asks a question about fine tuning will not be happy. So I don't have a good answer to that. Um, the second question about the, um, if I understood it, the second question is, um, do those oscillations in the scalar field have any other consequences in um, in cosmology. And um, I refer you to a recent paper by um, Mustafa Amin, Vivian Poulin, and Tristan Smith. So they consider the nonlinear evolution of that oscillating scalar field and show that it could lead to um, oscillons that would give you essentially something like a non- um, a non-Gaussian additional contribution to the energy early to the uh, matter distribution. And another possibility is um, that you could form um, gravitationally bound systems. And so that at some point, um, the stuff ceases to behave or decay like A to the minus um, five or six, but then begins to behave like um, dark matter. So I suggest that paper, Mustafa Amin, Vivian Poulin, and Tristan Smith. Okay, but ultimately we should see some effect in the galaxy structures in the, in the, I mean the... It's possible, but it was, it's not something we explored in that original paper, but it has been explored since then. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Zurab. <clears throat> Hello, Mark. <clears throat> um, then is also, uh, possibility of uh, uh, approach to Hubble tension uh, having a few percent of dark matter decaying in late times, uh, as we suggested in 2015 with Dolgo and Kachov. And uh, what do you comment about that? Yeah, again, I think it's the, um, I think the difficulty of those models is the um, varying acoustic oscillations. Um, which have their own inconsistencies, all right, between different measurements. Sorry, what's that question? Uh, they have different inconsistencies between different measurements as well. Uh, yes. Although I don't know if I understand the comment. Well, it means that different measurements at different redshifts, they have some, some uh, oh, yes. features. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. So I would say they have it the gives a lower potential the for the gravitational potential and uh, somehow affects that uh, uh, low well uh, part of the power spectrum of photons. But <clears throat> it's another question. So still within variance. So. Yeah, I think that sounds reasonable. Thank you. Um, so I read the, the 
question by Andre Ferrara uh, in the chat. Mm, can you please comment on the difficulties of model working on decreasing the early universe sound speed? Hold on, give me a sec. So what's the question again? The question is uh, if you uh, can comment on the difficulties of the model uh, working with decreasing sound speed in the early oh. universe. Oh, yeah. So the... <laughs> There's no difficulty with decreasing the early sound speed. Um, we tried to get a model to work. Um, we didn't try too hard. We, we tried very quickly and nothing obvious came out. So we didn't really explore it, but there have been um, several papers over the past few months that have, um, that, that are early dark energy with, sorry, that changed the um, early universe physics by changing the sound speed. Um, and I have not looked at those papers carefully, but they claim that they can get them to work. And there's no reason for me to doubt those claims. But there's nothing fundamentally impossible or inconsistent. But so like what's an example um, of a physical system? Sorry? Uh, what's a simple example if you can? Uh, oh, the variable sound speed, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, new interactions. Okay. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Yes, this was uh, the question. Privately to me, the question is this Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah. in fact, it is in fact grape juice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I actually um, have a, a more general question now. I mean, of course, uh, the H zero is, I, I guess, the the most like uh, the, the biggest discrepancy uh, that uh, we are facing now. Um, there are other smaller uh, discrepancies between uh, uh, parameters uh, determined by the CMB and. Uh, uh, parameters determined by uh, small redshift uh, large scale structure. Uh, can you comment on what you think is the most significant? Uh, um, if we need to be worried about these small tensions that uh, yeah. people think you know, about. In, in any area of science, when you're at the forefront, <clears throat> there's always things, loose sense that don't hang together. Because, um, you know, whenever you're at the forefront of science, you're always pushing the boundaries, you're always using new facilities, new techniques. Um, and there are, you know, depending on, there are, depending on who you ask and which data sets you look at, um, discrepancies, say, between the amplitude of the power spectrum inferred from the CMB and the amplitude inferred from galaxy surveys. Um, <clears throat> And when I look at these, well, first of all, I'm not the expert on this. I don't really look at all these discrepant, I don't look at the data that carefully myself, um, but to the extent that I do look at it, um, it seems that these are, uh, you know, more like, you know, possibly attributable to systematic effects or they're, you know, one sigma here, another sigma over here, another sigma over here, adding up to three sigma. And there's nothing yet that uh, I think that stands out and to me as something that's going to survive, um, you know, that we'll still be worrying about within two or three years or four or five years. The Hubble discrepancy, I don't know if we'll be thinking about it in two or three or four or five years, but um, I have, it seems to me more well established and more carefully scrutinized than some of the other discrepancies that people have been looking into. Okay, sorry, I muted. Uh, I understand. So you 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 think that uh, if you were to bet uh, on what you would be working on in three or four years, probably it will be the other thing. Yeah, but that's not a scientific statement. That's a. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, right. That's uh, an emotional, an emotional preference. <laughs> yeah, Ben. But I mean, we have to start from gut feeling again yeah. as well. And what? 
what about the, the, the small scale, like the uh, galactic uh, scale uh, uh, issues? Uh, do, you, do you have a comment about those? Or do you think it's just uh, uh, too uh, sensitive to systematics? Uh, which, which small scale effects? Like well, uh, the cost core problems, all these oh. uh, small, yeah. Yeah, that's just a completely separate can of worms. Um, right. <clears throat> I don't know that I have anything. Uh, again, I haven't seen anything there that um, that I'm fully confident, that I'm very confident will lead to new physics. But again, um, I think what I, what I think what I should say is that I I don't think we need to speculate. I think we need to be patient. Um, what I will say is that you know in the future there will be CMBS four and LSST, and you know people are talking about things beyond that, like at last in Europe and CMBHD in the United States. Um, so there are measurements that um, we can make in terms of technical capabilities, there, but there, they involve large projects that are probably beyond you know, the next few years. Um, but there are measurements that we can do to study those problems and um, experiment like CMBHD in combination with future galaxy surveys is going to be very powerful in terms of um, studying effects like core cusp problems um, and galactic structure um, with the kind of systematic control and statistics um, that we would need to really establish whether there was a, that in, for which um, we would have great confidence if there was a discrepancy with the standard model. Uh, Shahina has another question. Uh, if I may, actually, uh, there are some uh, results by the Holy Cow uh, collaboration. Uh, they have been, they have uh, basically different measurements of the H0 at uh, some different redshifts up to 0.7 or 0.8. And uh, they basically find different values of H0. And the H0 has some trends, some features, uh, which as if it's decreasing with the redshift. And actually in the paper of last February, we uh, found a similar uh, trend in the values of the H0 if we been different uh, low redshift data, a combination of BAO uh, cosmic chronometers and Pantheon data sets and the uh, strong lensing data. And we basically found some H0, some trends in the H0. If we, uh, some, our uh, trend, I mean, the descending trend in the H0 was about uh, 2.1 uh, sigma. If uh, we find some, uh, uh, basically we can stop, we have uh, similar trends, which are beyond three sigma, probably it, uh, it is telling us that the Hubble tension is uh, uh, caused by some late physics rather than the early physics, for example, early dark energy. So uh, there are ways to basically check uh, whether the early resolutions can actually work. So, uh, but we are, the low redshift data are not precise enough at the moment, but I, I think in a couple of years, we'll be able to check this. So that's something we can check. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So there are a few more questions in the chat, but I'll let, I'll let you decide whether to take them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen them. Uh, can you please comment on why we get different constraints on cosmological parameters uh, from CMB splitting at uh, L equal uh, 800? <laughs> so I guess, uh, I, I guess I probably the sub subtext is, uh, uh, is this uh, systematic that uh, place into the determination of H zero. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think that that's what's going on. I don't 
think that um, that that systematic effect, if it's there, would solve the Hubble tension. There's no obvious reason why it would move that sound horizon in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So then there was another question. The orientation of the ellipse of the CMB data changed substantially when include the EDE. Does that, does, does that tell anything significant in the coupled variation of parameters that brings the model consistent with local H0 measurements? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So you're talking about presumably this little thing, which yeah, I guess in that direction is so. Thing. Yeah, so the, the early dark energy models are designed to move the Hubble parameter to the right. Um, <clears throat> but as this plot shows, they do so um, in tandem with raising the cold dark matter density. Um, I don't know for sure, but it must be that the uh, so the very tight constraint here comes from the um, the very well measured sound horizon, and um, when we have early dark energy, we sort of decouple that um, tight measurement of the sound horizon from this combination of omega dark matter and H naught because we now have an additional combination of matter. Actually, I don't really I don't have a good answer. It's an interesting question. Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I'm guessing it has something to do with. I'm guessing if we, if I, if I look, we can, if we look, we can trace it back to um, the constraint to the um, damping scale or the matter radiation quality scale. Okay, makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, we are uh, approaching uh, uh, six thirty in Europe. I guess twelve thirty uh, in Baltimore, and you probably need to go to lunch. Uh, are there any last-minute questions? Or we leave a mark to keep lunch and Chianti. Take, take Chianti. Yes. Just like my <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very, very nice talk. And uh, um, uh, we will welcome you to the next uh, seminar in the series. Uh, this was uh, a, an amazing way to, to start. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for your invitation to Florence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye.